Welcome to the Third Wheel Podcast. I'm Caleb. I'm Shabs. Today, we have a very special episode. And why is it special, you ask? Well... I didn't ask. <laughs> okay. Well, our audience, now 150 subscribers strong, is going to be asking, why does this sound so bad? Why is there a really bad echo? Uh, I, I think, will. <laughs> yeah, I asked it. Yeah. Well... Our normal studio is being renovated, and so now we are in my living room. We still got the premium equipment going, but there's a little bit of an echo. So I do apologize for that, but it is what it is. I just really wanted the golden floors. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I just wanted the little uh, jacuzzi next Mm -hmm. to our studio. So, Mm -hmm. hey, it is what it is. We're working with the best we have, but that doesn't mean our conversation still can't be top-notch. Speaking of, I have a new joke for y'all. Oh, no. I made... Uh, recently i'm gonna go a little late but still i think it's relative it's a christmas joke christmas joke yeah yeah. you know this episode won't come out till 2024 correct (laughs) what i meant to say was this is just on time right before wait huh (laughs) (laughs) i say we're we're, we got a couple episodes coming up ahead of yeah that's what i'm saying yeah it's a little off topic but still i think it's you know save it bank it for next year all right that's good then So why are Catholics the best at celebrating Christmas? Why? Because they always keep Christ in Mass. Wow, that's awful. (laughs) Yeah, well, I'd like to see you come up with one. (laughs) Christmas-related joke. Uh, Oh, shoot. I I got no Christmas jokes. I I, I do apologize. (laughs) I did want to point out that, you know how people like eat to cope? Yeah. Okay, that is not me. when When I go to Disney World... I will eat 50 Mickey Mouse pretzels a day out of genuine like desire because I really want to. It has yeah. nothing to do with coping. <laughs> so what are, what are some, some coping actions you take? I mean, my coping is hanging out with friends. Now I got a girlfriend I can hang out with, which right. is great. But I mean, the, it's always been go-to. It's like hang out with people when I'm down in the dumps. Sure. I try to stay away from drinking. I try to stay away from other stuff that could lead to like dumb decisions being made. Um, yeah. You know, so my Mickey Mouse pretzel joke, oh, uh, I yeah. slid that in there without telling you it was a bit. Oh my. I'm, I'm going to, what I'm going to start doing, I think, is I'm going to slide my bits in when you're not expecting it. I feel like when I tell you this is a bit, you're prepared not to laugh. But you just told me this is a bit. Well, I already told it to you and you, la- and you actually laugh this time. Whereas when I normally tell you my bit's coming, you don't laugh. You know, and you're like, eh, it was okay. Or, you know, you could work on this and that. I'm thinking if I slide my bits in, mm. and then I tell you afterwards it was a bit to get a genuine reaction out of you. So you're, you're saying you don't actually eat 50 Mickey Mouse pretzels. Oh, no, that part was true. <laughs> so where's the bit? <laughs> <laughs> but I, but the joke was I didn't I don't do it to cope. I do it out of oh. pure choice. <laughs> gotcha. I, I feel like that's real, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, jokes are tragedy plus time. <laughs> what? <laughs> You know, okay. Yeah, people make 9-11 jokes now, right? It's like you can't do it when 9-11 was fresh. You had to wait till time was, you know, now enough time has passed where people can make those jokes. Yeah, but you know what's funny about that is there actually is some subjects that people will stay away from regardless of time. Yeah, that's fine, but not 9-11. Not 9-11. <laughs> and I don't definitely know. not eating 50 pretzels a day. I do. <laughs> I'll joke about that all night long. Gotcha. <laughs> well, you know what a coping mechanism of mine? I don't drink, I don't eat to cope. What I do is I walk and I listen to metal music and I think about exacting revenge on those who wronged me. <laughs> I'm on, uh, see, the thing about that is I'm on step seven of my master plan, mm-hmm. which is, um, it's titled Soon. 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 <laughs> but step 10 yeah. They'll be sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclaimer, that's a meme I saw. It has nothing to do with oh, okay. it. It's not my original joke. So I don't steal jokes unless I give credit. Yes, so. and no, I do not take exact revenge on people. <laughs> no. Yeah, someone's going to read the transcript of this episode and but, take it out of context. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. You know what? Then yeah. I'll actually take exact my revenge on you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway... Chaps, today I want to celebrate. Oh, what are we celebrating? It's Godzilla's birthday. It's Godzilla's okay. birthday. Yeah. Well, when this episode releases, it'll have passed. How old, how old is the big lizard now? Dude, 70 years old. He's 70 years 70. old. 70. And that He crazy? doesn't look it at all. <laughs> yeah, he looks great. <laughs> yeah, all that CG makeup really does its work. I would say he's had tons of work done because he's different <laughs> sizes. He's different <laughs> shapes. He has different faces. Yeah, One yeah, time yeah. he was a weird looking lizard. His breath has changed color a few times. Yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So I've been trying to get you to watch Godzilla minus one like eight times. Oh. <laughs> and each time you, you Greek out on me. <laughs> I, I was. <laughs> yes. You abandoned ship. <laughs> tis, unfor- t- tis unfortunate. It is not at all because I'm not interested. <laughs> I guarantee it. Quite the opposite. I actually made you a Godzilla fan within yes. the past year or so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've been actually very looking forward to Godzilla minus one. But dude, movie theaters and me like do not get along anymore. That's weird um, because you and I go see movies pretty close to together, <laughs> you know. Or sometimes you'll go out with your with our friend Michael. Not yeah, not that I'm like, not that I don't. Want, and basically, what I'm trying to say is that I only go maybe twice a year anymore. Mm. It's just because like I don't know, like the act of maybe it's laziness, but the act of like making time for it and getting out, you know, and like going to a theater, it takes a lot nowadays. So maybe it's that. Maybe it's because uh, you know, the virus sort of change that industry a bit, you know, to where like we're all super comfortable just watching our stuff at home, you know, instead of experiencing it at the theater. Well, see, you bring up an interesting point. COVID kind of normalized streaming. Mm -hmm. But do you think we were going to go that route anyway? Uh, Yeah, well, something maybe not as drastic. That was like a drastic push. I think it would have lasted a few more years. But like basically, I mean, we also we all saw the writing on the wall. Movie theaters were just kind of like already on their way out a little bit. Right. And, like, I'm pretty sure streaming was, like, planned way before. Well, I was going to say, because streaming already took out, like, movie rental stores. Yeah, exactly. Like, you'll find a Hollywood video. I think I know where a couple, or even around here, are still going. It was only a matter of time before Disney launched their platform. They might have, like, jump-started a little bit, but or it may have released exactly on time. So We will get back to Godzilla, I promise. But he raises up a good question. Is Disney Plus hurting Disney in the long run? Because I was reading some articles mm-hmm. where it's actually very much hurting them as opposed to helping them. I mean, yeah, just look at their number. Their numbers are this year. Now we won't know like the full financial report until next year, but we do know. I think their stocks are like down. Yeah, their stocks are down thirty percent or something like crazy numbers. I'm gonna say they filed for tax purposes. They had to put down that they were at a loss, right? Yeah, Which they were important. absolutely at a loss. But they have to put why. Right. And I was reading that they put in there. They, they didn't put in there that like, oh, it's because we were woke. Or like that, They're not going to admit that. They're sure. never ever to, in a billion years going to admit they made a mistake. Yeah, exactly. However, they did put down that their movies weren't resonating with audiences and that there was a heavy push on social... And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but there was a heavy yeah. push on social issues. Yeah, there's an interview with Bob Iger where he goes over that. He basically says, yeah. he basically puts most of the blame on the fact that they have taken focus away from storytelling and put right. more in like agenda building. And that's good. To me, though, that interview is more of a PR stunt. <laughs> I don't think they're actually going to no. go forward with that. But when you look at, at the bottom line, it's about money. So when yeah. you look at their actual tax write offs and they're like, they have to be, they have to be honest. They can't. Oh, yeah. And they're sitting here like, yeah, we, we put we put heavy emphasis on social issues mm-hmm. and it's not resonating with audiences. Will they learn from that? Will they change? I don't know. Because mm-hmm. Bob Iger's all over the place with whose fault it was. He's going to blame the guy that he replaced. Yeah, He's going to blame lack of supervision on set. He's going to blame all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. I saw that movie Wish. <laughs> you it, saw it? <laughs> oh, it was awful. Yeah, it was bad. And it's like, that's the real issue. Uh-huh. Is like... The movies, they suck. It has nothing to do with supervision. Well, may, maybe to some extent, but like the the premise of Wish was never going to work. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> sorry, my cat's messing with the board. Not the board, but trying to sniff around it and jump on the table. Well, let's see what happens. Yeah, that's the only kicker on filming at the house. As long as she doesn't step on the record button, I think we're okay. But, no, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, like genuinely, like every single movie I've seen... There's an article about it, you know, like, oh, my gosh, yeah. I can't believe what Disney put in their movie. And, like, that's what they want. You know, like, it's easy baiting, you know, and, like, that's the that's the way they can cause an uproar. It's a, it's sad that that's the only way that movies or, like, Disney movies cause an uproar or start conversation nowadays. It's because of controversy. Right. Generally, I don't know if the, when the last film came out, maybe in Kanto, where, like, everyone loved it. Yeah. And it was talked about because everyone loved it. Right. And even then, that was like the last one where the good ones were kind of on their way out. Yeah. <laughs> because cause even then, like that, that's a good movie and the songs are pretty good. But mm-hmm. like there was nothing in there that just really like stuck with me. Sure. Music wise, where it was like stuck in my head. Like there's obviously, we don't talk about Bruno. Mm-hmm. That's the only song that I remember. Yeah. Now my sister knows that song more. But that's that's a far cry from what we saw 10 years or eight years prior to that with like 
the movies like Frozen, yeah. where Let It Go is in every kid's mm -hmm. house or any kid's room, you know, playing everywhere. And Kanto was the last one where kids were kind of singing to it and, you know. It lasted a while. It did. It definitely was a little fad, but. But that was a couple years ago and nothing's out right now that's yeah. like really hitting those beats. Yeah, they've kind of pulled away from like the musicals and they've sort of gone to like these. Honestly, a lot of them just sound so boring. Yeah. Like the whole Elemental movie. Sure. Like sounded really boring. And this past movie, which looked so freaking cheap. Yeah. Like, I don't know why, but like they're, this was supposed to be their big, like what, 75 year anniversary movie. Yeah. That's a, that's a big milestone. And they just put out like the cheapest garbage looking garbage. Like legitimately, yeah. I think the animation looks really cheap. I haven't seen the movie, so I can't judge everything, but I've you know read enough about it to kind of understand what it's about. Yeah. But putting that aside, the advertising sucked. It looked mm. like a movie, like a straight, one of those straight to video movie kind of, or straight to home video, which just kind of is actually. Absolutely. But this movie apparently was like supposed to be a big push, but you wouldn't under, you wouldn't know that if you just looked at the trailer or the one ad they put out, you know, You're where right. it, kind of, it didn't even look like Disney. It looked like another <laughs> low yeah. end studio. That I was gonna say. Out. I was gonna say it was a cheap DreamWorks project. Yeah, it kind of looked like, like even <laughs> yeah. even DreamWorks looks better than that. Like, yeah, I was like, this this is Disney. Okay, uh, maybe it's like a little short or something, you know, for like little little kids. But no, this was like their big full fledged movie. movie. Yeah, this is their big movie. I'm like, yeah, dang. Dude. Yeah. So I mean, this isn't a review for Wish, but like the like you said, animation was god awful. <laughs> like it was it was bad. Yeah. And then the script. Mm -hmm was terrible yeah so every scene every frame in that movie was a reference to another movie yeah so the main character's friends they all conveniently look like the seven dwarfs there's a scene where the main character is on the run and she puts on an outfit and she looks like the the um uh, fairy from cinderella mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're like every everything was a reference yeah, to another it was supposed movie. to it almost seemed like it, they were trying to do like stephen king dark tower but like <laughs> yeah. disney for some yeah. reason but like they didn't use those characters they just kind of used their likenesses and right. made like a hollowed ripoff of those characters mm -hmm. there, there's a scene where a character just falls and instead of falling normally and going ah he goes oh from tarzan <laughs> and so i'm sitting here like dude i want to picture the script and mm -hmm. it's like okay a guy dressed as character from Shrek falls and yells like Tarzan <laughs> and lands on, and it's just like it's just like reference, reference, reference. It, hasn't, it just there's no substance, no at all. nothing, and it's like it has no original bone in his body. Yeah, apparently there was like talks way before, which was made that there was supposed to be a movie that actually not just referenced but had a character from every single Disney film ever made. Now that sounds kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, right. It was supposed to be like freaking Smash Brothers, but like you know Disney yeah. characters. Yeah. And this is one that what we got. Right. They they couldn't commit to the whole idea, right. so they're just like let's let's just rip them off, you know. It's really weird. And it was bad. And, yeah. uh, and like again, it's a musical, but there's not a. I'm trying to think of one song that really stuck with me. And now now that I'm trying to think about it, I'm like, okay, there's a song. There, there's mm -hmm. a one where the wizard he turns evil. For no reason, mind yeah. you. He's like, there, there's a song where he's called, it's called This Is The Thanks I Get, and he's gloating about how much work he does, and this is all he gets in return. So that that song was kind of catchy. Mm -hmm. but that's me reaching. I hadn't thought about it till this conversation when we had I didn't even know it had songs. Yeah, no, oh. it, was, it was a full-blown musical. Oh, wow. And it was very generic, like, beat the villain at the end where everyone starts singing, and then for some, for some reason their chest lights up, and then it somehow overpowers the villain. It was bad. <laughs> it was a terrible movie. Yeah. So, and again, lost money. Yeah. Where do we start with that conversation? <laughs> where, I don't remember. Mickey Mouse pretzels. I say, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, was just, I don't remember this was going. And I just uh, started we're talking ranting. about streaming and just like the down, kind of yes, like the yes, downside yes, yes. of it um, and how it's hurting Disney. Thank um, you. <laughs> yeah. I definitely think that's contributing factor. I just, Disney has zero vision left. Yeah. And, you know, it's been, the, it's been on radar for a while that that's been the case because, again, you know, I saw a great editorial about talking about, you know, like the history of Disney and how like every single time that they've taken a nosedive like this, what do they do? They buy a company mm -hmm. and have them pump out like all this original content. Mm -hmm. They bought they did it with Marvel, they did it with Star Wars, and now like they've owned they own pretty much just everything. There's nothing left to buy and they don't know what direction to go. They have zero vision left. Yeah. Usually they just rely on other people to make the creative stuff for them. But did you see Warner Brothers Discoveries trying to buy Paramount Plus? No, really. So Discovery just bought Warner Brothers, which owns HBO Max. Or and, Max. You know. Yeah, <laughs> right. And that's why they had to consolidate it to just Max. Right. Right. But now they're looking at Paramount Plus. And I was like, my God, bro, just. Uh, eventually it's going to come down to like maybe 
it's like a two party system, like just like yeah. two <laughs> streaming services. But they're what's sick is that they're going to keep them all separate services. They're yeah. just going to charge for everyone individually, even though they all own. So like Disney so? owns Hulu. Mm-hmm. If they charge separate for Hulu, they own ESPN, but they charge separately for ESPN. So I think that's kind of what Disney's trying to do. Mm-hmm. Max, yeah. I feel like would keep Paramount Plus floating. And still charge for it, but bundle it. They bundle it usually. That, that's interesting you bring that up because like there's a sometimes a random Marvel show will end up on Hulu, <laughs> and that's how. <laughs> right, exactly. So that's interesting you brought that up. Any way to boost the numbers, I guess. Mm-hmm. Speaking so. of boosting numbers, how do we boost these numbers? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean we've had some crazy good growth this past mm-hmm. weekend. Not even week, dude, because. I, I was going to take the week off and not even post shorts, yeah. but I ended up taking some good Christmas games one. Mm-hmm. Those were all original videos, by the way. So yeah, the Roomba I, popping balloons. Especially like that one. The terrible ad I did for Mouth Tape. I, I'm proud of that, even mm-hmm. though it only got 100 views. But we hit like 30K views just over the weekend, mm-hmm. and then that boosted us like 40 subs almost. Like yeah, give dude. or take 33, something like that. That's only pretty good. a few days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So keep it up, guys. I don't know how much this will transfer to the podcast, but you know I'm working it, and sometimes you just get lucky, uh, you get a boost in subs. So I'm pretty proud of where that's going. We might to, we're already going to do a 200 sub celebration here. It sounds like yeah, so. I mean, it makes me thankful. There's like some big YouTubers right there right now who are actually suffering a lot because YouTube is pushing for shorts, mm. and they don't they're not in a position where they can or they don't know really how to implement themselves. I'm glad right. we're kind of tackling that early on. Well, see, most of my recordings through my phone. It's hard enough, like taking a regular camera and trying to condense it down to a phone's yeah, view yeah. for shorts. So maybe we just got in at the right time where shorts are really kicking <laughs> off. So yeah. we'll see. Um, anyway, back to Godzilla. Godzilla minus one was fantastic, uh-huh. and I loved it. I loved it so much. I saw it twice. It was so good. When I took my girlfriend, she had no expectations and loved it. Um, probably the best movie of the year, but it's definitely in people's like top five for the year. Definitely the best Godzilla film, I would have to say. Like, period. What really got me interested is that I know you don't like him, but Jeremy Johns put that as his number one of the year, mm. which is like, ah, oh, that's that's actually pretty good. No, that's good. I mean, whatever helps. <laughs> he doesn't have as many subscribers as you'd think, and, and no, as he I doesn't. Would think, yeah, he doesn't. He never like, has. Because he, well, no, he's the go-to movie review guy, though, for most people. Oddly enough, yeah, he is. Yeah, but he only has like a million something, or that, maybe two million. That trips me out. <laughs> Because I think the person behind him, I would say, is Chris Stuckman. Those mm-hmm. are like the two, like everyone goes to them too. Oh, yeah. And yet their subscriber count is very low. Mm-hmm. I'm shocked. Yeah, I've never really understood it, but it's just, it's he's never he's never been phased by it. He's been with it for like 12, yeah. 13 I'm, years or something. I'm sure he's very well monetized. I'm sure he mm-hmm. makes good money. There's never been a Jeremy Johns controversy. Right. And yet, I don't even think he does sponsorships. I no, think I've, about yeah, it. I've, I've never seen one. I've never seen him once say this video is sponsored by. Yeah. <laughs> it's just him talking, and he's usually he'll change his hair up. Sometimes he'll grow mm-hmm. his beard out. Sometimes he's more pale than usual. Right, and you know, sometimes he looks like he just did drugs. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> um, anyway, he's just he's just always done what he's been doing. Right, but he watches most movies of the year, and for him to put it at a number one, I'm like, that's interesting. Like, yeah, no, I mean, he can, it, and he said he wasn't even like a Godzilla fan until yeah, the more recent Godzilla films. So well, I'm like, that's kind of like me. Well, I wanted to go into that recently. It was like, I I got you on the American ones, and then and then we mm. watched one of the cheesier <laughs> Japanese ones, Japanese like. American hybrid ones, because yeah. it was like a mixture. They hired American guys to be goofy, <laughs> but. That was a really good. That's one of my favorites. But for some reason, minus one, like they just finally balanced out the humans and the Godzilla character. Uh-huh. Like they just, they both made them super cool and separate and contained. And just, they focused on making a good movie. And Godzilla minus one was so good that they released the Kong versus Godzilla trailer, the second movie. <laughs> and I watched it and it pissed me off because it was terrible. <laughs> I was like, there's like no love, there's no heart behind it. It's just full on Hollywood garbage again yeah you know and it, it made me so upset because i lo- like guys i love godzilla i love him i love him so much that i like godzilla king of the monster even though it wasn't that good <laughs> you know what i mean and i'm his biggest defender but minus one was so good it's making a good movie telling a good story that as soon as they dropped the american one i was very angry and i was pissed off i was like this movie sucks you know and it hasn't even come out yet but hey, maybe it'll, maybe maybe it'll be good. Maybe they'll learn. Maybe they've yeah. learned something. Yeah, I don't know. They've made Godzilla pink. I mean, minus. <laughs> oh, oh geez, never mind. Okay. Yeah. Have you, have you seen the trailer? Uh-uh. He lights up. He's pink. He's not blue anymore. Now, granted, 
some of the other Japanese movies changes this color too. Uh-uh. Okay, fine. But I just don't see it fitting in well with this version or this character. I just think it's going to be something dumb. I think he's going to fall into a weird pit and hit some weird goo and then turn purple. I don't think it has anything to do with good storytelling. Mm. I don't think it's even a real creative decision. I think it's just because they were like, you know, he's been blue for three films. Let's make it pink. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they'll. I mean, minus one probably made a lot of money because a lot of people saw it. Maybe they'll learn their lesson this time. But that was straight Japan. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was straight Japan. This is the American one. Right. They have nothing to do with each other. No. What I'm saying is, I'm I'm saying they've probably learned from Japan. Possibly, but this movie's already kind of done and it's coming out in a couple months. Yeah. There's not much. Well, they can no, there's change. no saving this one. I'm no. talking about in the future of Godzilla. Yeah. Um, the, this one doesn't make money. They'll just they're probably going to they're probably going to see like the difference between performance between the two and then but like one if this one fails they'll be like oh well minus one did really well what did they do well and then try to maybe capture that yeah but what i want to talk about today mm. okay is the terrible worst godzilla film which you haven't seen or you have seen 1998 Are you talking about the one with um Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick. Yeah, I saw that more than anything else actually yeah, really all the other godzilla no this that's this is the godzilla film i've seen probably three times as a kid or recently? Too? As a kid, yeah, I haven't seen it recently, but um, I remember it being. I remember being quite happy with it. I was fond of it. Yeah, I mean, when you're a kid, you don't really ask for too much. And uh, but I was kind of in on it, you know. Like I watched that um, I, at the time. I was a Matthew Broderick fan, even though I know I'm a very, very much in the minority of that. Um, I mean, I don't hate the guy. I even watched. I even watched the Godzilla show that came attached to it. So I was like. Yeah, at that time it was it hit me in the right age. I was probably maybe I don't even remember how old, old I was when I saw it because obviously I saw it when I was older because um, I was you know one years old when that came. <laughs> even not even so probably nine or ten. I don't know something like that. Have you seen a lot of Roland Emmerich's movies? No, that's the only one I've ever seen. You're okay. talking about they're the ones who did like the big disaster films, yeah, right? Independence yeah. Day, most recently Moonfall. The only one I've ever seen was the Godzilla one. Okay, I haven't even seen Independence Day. You haven't even seen 2012. That was a big one too. No, you're right. I saw 2012, and I also yeah. saw Day After Tomorrow. Okay, I was gonna we say we saw that one like 800. Times. I was gonna say everyone's seen 2012. Yeah, I saw 2012. I oh my gosh, I remember so little about it though. I just remember the ending. And that's about it. I, I remember, remember Day After Tomorrow because I've seen that like eighty hundred times. That's fair. Was that was that any good? Uh, which one? Day After Tomorrow. I don't think so. But okay. I was like, I loved it as a kid. Um, but I don't know if it's good anymore. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, they did an extended preview on TV, mm-hmm. and it ended at the right point. So I, w- I want to say Edge of Tomorrow was when every single natural disaster that could happen was all happening at once. There was an ice age. There was tornadoes. There was all the right. Am I correct? Edge of tomorrow, day after tomorrow. Day after tomorrow. You said, edge you said edge of oh, tomorrow. Oh, sorry. Yes, that's I, th- exactly, I got mixed up with a good that's, film. <laughs> that's, that's, basically, <laughs> that's basically what happened. So, like, it starts out kind of small. Like, in Japan, like, there's hail that's the size of, like, ba- uh, footballs. It starts just, like, killing people. And it's like, oh, my God, what's going on? And it was, it was probably an allegory for global warming, but I was too stupid to understand that at the time. Yeah. And then, like, you know, tsunamis hit New York City or right. whatever the crap they – yeah, it was New York City. Now that I think about it, it was probably a really stupid film. But <laughs> I just remember, you know, the disaster part and that being a draw. Same reason I, I liked the Godzilla movie. It was like I just loved seeing destruction. Yeah. Massive scale. There was a, t- there was a moment at the, towards the end where, like, there's a ship – that somehow in the middle of the city, I think, like in the snow, and someone like climbs aboard, but then wolves somehow get in New York City. Mm. Wolves somehow show <laughs> up, and they started attacking him. Uh, I remember that was a pretty tense scene, but it was really weird. It had really annoying characters, and I actually noticed this as a kid. It a trope. I think all these movies have it, where they have like this really annoying group of characters who survivors who survive everything. You yeah. know, like yeah. they have no way, like there's no experience behind them. They're just like there's like three, two or three comic reliefs. There's like the quirky scientist dude, and then there's like you know the the, the hero dude, and they always just survive everything. Yeah. All, and they're always the only ones left. I'm just <laughs> like, all these awesome so, yeah. people who die like almost immediately because they yeah. re- they set up these really cool, interesting characters that like die almost immediately. Right. So you're describing what I'm going to get to is Roland Emmerich's problem is, mm-hmm. one, you brought up the wolf somehow making it into New York City. Yeah. He he doesn't care 
about the logic behind some of the, his scenes or his right. choices. He just says, that looks cool. I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would be cool if these reporters and these New Yorkers just got attacked by wolves. That'd be sick. Now, I could I could be remembering that wrong. I haven't seen it in a while, sure. but I'm pretty sure for certain <laughs> that there was a ship that fell out of the harbors <laughs> and wolves were inside. All right. So mm. then there's that, and then the, the annoying characters. Yeah. All of his movies. Now, granted, I haven't seen Resurgence, Independence Day, the second one. Okay. And I haven't seen Moonfall. Moonfall looks very close to the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> They're all the same. They're movie. all the same. But they do have those characters. They got the scientist guy that nobody listens to, but mm-hmm. he's the one he's caught, he's trying to tell people, and no yep. one's listening. Yep. <laughs> uh, you got the the doomsday survivor guy. Right. You got the. Uh, Okay, so in, there's always a reporter too, usually. Right, a really in, annoying reporter. In 2012, it was Woody Harrelson who played the Doomsday guy who's preacher standing. Dude, but yeah, yeah. The, the preacher guy who's like, the end is near. Mm-hmm. All his movies have that too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the same. He he just takes that template, mm-hmm. and then he's like, I'm gonna focus on visuals. I'm gonna focus on natural disasters. Yeah. I'm gonna focus on explosions. He's Which almost the, like Michael Bay, except without the. Visual flair. Well, the only thing he's appeal. good at is making good trailer fodder. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. That's like he, what that's I what mean, people go for because they saw the trailers and they're like, "Oh, that's gonna look cool. That's gonna be cool. That's gonna be awesome date night, babe." And then like, right, and ninety then, minutes of boring, <laughs> boring, boring dialogue. <laughs> yeah. So what I think is interesting and why it translates to this terrible Godzilla film was because I want to say I googled it. Mm. And him and his lead writer, who he carries to every film, Dean Devlin. Right. Now, I haven't done my research on if he was attached to every single film Roland Emmerich's done. Mm-hmm. But I know for a lot of them, he's attached as his writer. This is the guy he carries with him to movies to get the stuff written. Mm-hmm. So I Googled Godzilla 98, and as I do so every couple of years. <laughs> And what pops up is both of them coming in and saying, yeah, that movie was not my fault. And mm-hmm. they're both wanting to cast the blame elsewhere. So me realizing that, you know, both of them are full of crap and it's definitely their fault. Right. I decided to Google the movie for real and start doing some research. And yeah. I very much enjoy talking about movies that have really troubled productions. Yeah. Or even just listening to some of the creative decisions behind, like, this is why we did this. This mm-hmm. is why we did that. This is where our mind was. I, have you seen the documentary on Troll 2, Best Worst Movie? No. Yeah, it's really good because the director comes in. <laughs> I've heard of it. It's now, a documentary yeah. on the making of Troll 2, and they get all the actors in. And, to be clear, yeah. this is not Trolls 2. This right. is Troll 2, a really yeah. old movie. Yeah, not but... the animated classic by <laughs> whoever. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But anyway, the actors come in like, yeah, the movie's terrible, and it's like, you know, not enjoyable at all. Mm. But the director, they bring him in. And he starts getting mad. He starts getting offended. He's like, I made yeah. a good movie. And another thing is his wife wrote the movie too. So yeah, he's not self-aware enough to understand no. why everyone... Trolls 2 has like a cult following, but a troll right. 2 has a cult following, but like not for the reason that is good. It's right. just like they want to make fun of it. He does not realize it. Right. And he so just he, thinks everyone loves it. So he comes into this fan celebration thing and he starts getting mad and he starts... He storms out. You yeah. know, so like on on his perspective, he goes in expecting like a big like Q and A and like, yeah. dude, this is a good movie. Thanks for making. It. No, he comes in, everyone's laughing, they're mm-hmm. joking at his expense essentially. Yeah. On top of that, him being the director, his wife writing the film, he, mm-hmm. basically from his perspective, everyone's crapping on his him and his wife's yeah. work. So, and that that was a tough pill for him to swallow. Right. So, anyway, yeah, that's like. It's kind of like Tommy Wiseau with The Room, you know, how he didn't understand why people loved the film. He just kind of assumed it was because he was genius or something. Like, Yeah, and but he's always been a good sport, though. Not always. <laughs> really? You, really? No. <laughs> I haven't seen the ones where he went I crazy. mean, like when like all the reviews came out for the original film, like he he basically uh, claimed copyright over all of them because oh, okay. they were making fun of him. Like, he, was a, he was a kind of a, honestly not a good sport at all for a long time until – and then he broke – he kind of uh, – he split up with his friend who he made the movie with. You know, they had a big falling out. And then and then years and years and years and years later, they made The Disaster Artist and they right. all came back to And I, I've said, I've re- I got the book and I read it. It's really good. Oh, I yeah. also saw the movie, which was okay. I like yeah. the movie. R.I.P. R- R- James Franco. Oh, James Franco. <laughs> or I guess R.I.J. Rest in Jail. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Real quick, back to Godzilla. I think it's funny. I don't know if you realize this, but there's a Siskel and Ebert cameo. Yeah, or not cameo. Easter yes. egg. Yes. So the reason for that, like, legitimately, uh, 
I think Cisco and Ebert has always have always hated their uh, his other films. As do I. So what he did was he made Cisco and Ebert like really like doofus, you know, yeah. like big doofus, and like there's the mayor, and then there's like the yes man who just says yes to whatever the mayor says. But literally, what's interesting about that? It was super petty, but the Cisco and Ebert, like actual Cisco and Ebert, when they reviewed Godzilla, they were like, "Man, like you have us in the film. Why don't you have like Godzilla eat us or something?" I remember like, that. They're like, well, like if you're gonna have, if you're gonna make fun of us, if you're gonna like, you know, why don't you have a giant monster crush us? You yeah, know, like, why didn't you kill us off? And it's yeah. like, wow. <laughs> yeah. They were like, if you're gonna spoof us, at least do us right. You can't even <laughs> spoof, you know, your haters, right? <laughs> right. So, with that little side note there, yes, the movie was a disaster. It's been talked about to death. I want to focus very much so on the behind the scenes production quality of it. Godzilla 1998 actually has a more extensive history than you'd think. So, it started with American film producer and distributor Henry G. Saperstein, who had co-produced and distributed past Godzilla films for the American market through his studio, UPA. He got permission from Toho, which is the Japanese company that basically makes all the Godzilla movies, created, I'm not 100% sure on their history. So, he got permission from Toho to pitch a new Godzilla film to Hollywood Studios, and he said, for 10 years, I pressured Toho to make one in America. So he was pushing it in Japan to make one for America. Yeah. They weren't interested. But he got permission to say, to pitch a, to use likeness or the Godzilla name to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Oops. To Hollywood and to get it like made here instead. Finally, they agreed. He met with Sony Pictures producers. Again, Sony's Japanese based. They already should see a potential for a Godzilla movie. But for right. some reason, they said no. Okay. So. Saperstein met with Sony Pictures producers Kerry Woods and Robert Fried for discussions regarding a live-action Mr. Magoo film, but the discussions led to the availability of the rights to Godzilla. Are you familiar, familiar with Mr. Magoo? Only the live-action one with Leslie Nielsen. Oh, God. <laughs> I wonder if he's the reason why that actually got made. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as you do, the, the discussions from Mr. Magoo turned to Godzilla. You know, because same franchise, same bane. I'm, I'm trying to picture how that went. He was like, by the way, how about Godzilla? And he's like, oh, yeah, let's do it. Hmm. So interested, Woods and Fried proposed the idea to Columbia Pictures, but were initially rejected. He said, we pitched the idea to Columbia, and they passed outright. So they heard it, and they're like, that sounds dumb. We're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and they said it, they were worried it was going to be too camping. Yeah, well, yeah. prove it's, them wrong. <laughs> the two also tried to pitch the idea to TriStar Pictures, who is the... The logo is the big winged horse, right? TriStar. Oh, they, yeah. They said no initially, even though they're the ones that ended up making it and releasing it. But <laughs> they got shot down. However, Woods ended up talking to his wife, interestingly enough, and she said, why don't you just go over everyone's heads and go talk to the head executive, Peter Gruber, which he did. Hmm. So he goes to Peter Gruber, and then Gruber was like, dude, heck yeah, Godzilla. Frick yeah, let's As do he it. was sniffing coat. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> Try Star. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, in his words, he recalled, Peter got it. He saw the movie in his head. He was like, Godzilla, the fire breathing monster? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly how it went down 100%. So Try Star Vice Chairman Ken Lindberger went to Tokyo. Lucky. Went to Tokyo and got to mess with the rights and get it. He, they, they paid. 400k in advance they were to be able to use the likeness so originally they were going to make a trilogy with the promise of remaining true to the original series that's so all, that's all it costs 400k no that was the advance so oh, they were like here we'll put this money forward down gotcha. payment right yeah yeah so let's see they announced it. They said it's going to be a trilogy. A bunch of people that made the original movies, not all of them, but a bunch of them, because there's tons of directors, tons of creators. They were all like, yes. A um, bunch of Japanese directors and special effects directors were like, dude, we have great expectations. Mm. There's something about Japan where they really want America to catch on to something that's really good in Japan. Right. So whenever an anime gets ported over here, they just celebrate. Like Crunchyroll, I bet, was a big win for Japanese markets oh, yeah. to like now they can market their stuff in America. And yeah, and, there, and if you think about it, there is it's almost like the same thing I, I say about songs, you know, like there are so many songs 
in the world that I release that you would just like love, you would jive to, but you may, there's a good chance you'll never hear them, you know? Right. Same to like, there's a lot of great Japanese films, you know, I mean like Korean and um, probably some, actually there's some Chinese films like I've really enjoyed, uh, but like the majority, you know, so many people never see them, even though they're fantastic, you know, like yeah. you have such a good product, you know, like, yeah, I think you'd be celebrating, you know, like, holy crap, yeah. you know, like America, you know, like once they see it, everyone sees it. So I just barely got into Bollywood music. And then oh, yeah. same thing. I never would have seen that had I not accidentally bumped into some college right. friends that were from that region. So mm-hmm. so everyone's looking forward. Everyone from Japan's happy. Everyone's pleased that a new approach will be taken. Oh, I had a thought. I wonder if it's the same way that we, people in America hope that China catches on because China is like has a billion people. And if something goes big in China, you've made a ton of money. That's why Transformers is carried for so long up until well, yeah, the last Yeah, if you think about just like the reach that America has compared yeah, to Japan, like right. uh, in, in the entertainment industry. Yes. Once you hit America, you hit everywhere. Yeah, so. and essentially. So let's see. Originally, the director in 1994, a year before I was even born, Jan DeBont became attached to direct and began pre production on the film for a 96 release. So we know that didn't happen. DeBont's Godzilla would have discarded the character's atomic origin and replaced it with one wherein Godzilla is an artificial creation constructed by Atlanteans to defend humanity against a shape-shifting extraterrestrial monster called the Gryphon. So the original pitch was nuclear weapons and uh, you know global warming, all that stuff. Let's toss that out. Godzilla is actually from Atlantis. <laughs> and he fights alien named yeah, Gryphon. He, yeah. So, did you like how we changed the letters around? So it's not Griffin. <laughs> Stan Winston and his company were employed to do the effects for the film. He started crafting sculptures of Godzilla and the Gryphon. I kind of want to know what those look like. I bet you they look terrible. The Gryphon sounds awful. Yeah. Imagine how much designs get ended up thrown out when they pull the plug on a movie. But like, imagine how really cool designs would have been canceled. DeBont later left the project after TriStar refused to approve of his budget of 100 to $120 million. It's a lot of money back then. Nowadays, not so much, unfortunately. Like, the creator was, what, 80? Yeah. Yeah, so, like, it's, that's a lot of money back then. What's interesting is later, when you get to Elliot and Rocio's script, they did get approved for that money, but then Roland Emmerich gets on, <laughs> and then they're not approved for the money, so mm. they're, they're swapping back and forth. On how much they're allowed to have money wise. So right. they, they fire this <coughs> excuse me. They fire this guy after he doesn't get the money he wants. He's mm-hmm. got these really great ideas. He's making an Aquaman movie before Aquaman's cool. Right. And he can't do it. So ninety three comes around. Ted Elliott and Terry Rocio are hired to write the screenplay. Prior to their hiring, Elliot and Rocio were searching for their next project and were offered Godzilla by their advisor, Carrie Woods. If you remember Carrie, he's the guy that talked, his wife talked them into going over his studio's heads. The duo initially declined the offer several times, so they didn't want to touch it, but Elliot recalled, we actually turned the project down about two or three times because we weren't sure we knew what to do with it. That is 100% fair, and I wish that's what Roland Emmerich did. They were like, we, we don't know anything about Godzilla, right. we're not interested. Woods eventually convinced them to discuss the project with TriStar. I'm starting to not like TriStar that much. Elliot and Rocio wrote a three and a half page story outline that secured their employment. <laughs> wow. Rocio believes that they were offered the project due to their inexperience in writing franchise type titles. But they had experience launching franchises. Mm-hmm. They had a lot of faith in these guys, called them uh, talented sci fi buffs. So they also said we're not going to make it funny. He said we let's we insisted we not make light of the monster. They wanted to avoid a comic like approach and instead take the material seriously with a legitimate science fiction story that would invoke feelings of mystified or scared or awe inspired for audiences. Hmm. Oh no, this is a big word here. Rocio wanted to create a balance in anthropomorphizing Godzilla, not wanting to stray from Godzilla's human humanistic personality. Yeah, that makes sense. But not humanize him entirely. Okay, so they were trying to balance here. How do we make a sitcom without making him a sitcom? You know, uh, make Godzilla <laughs> pregnant with it. Yeah. Which is kind of what ended up happening in Roland Emmerich's version. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> just missing the laugh tracks. Let's see. Elliot found the key to the story after a friend who was also a Godzilla fan expressed that he found Godzilla not to be a good guy, but a territorial beast. Okay, so they finally, they asked a Godzilla fan. They say, you, sir, stop right there. Do you like Godzilla? <laughs> He's got like a giant Godzilla head. Just like, yeah. Ooh. He's like, no, I'm not really a fan. I'm a casual. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. 
That to me meant that you could actually present Godzilla on the side of the angels, but he could still be a monster. So they added, try to add details and make it more realistic. What they, the heck is this? <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> I know. What are they the discussing thing. right now? That, that's the thing is like they're, they were, they had this idea that they ended up just tossing. <laughs> so the first guy, if you remember, he's like, no, this is about to be Aquaman 0. 0.5. Right. Right. Got rid of that because he didn't get the money he yeah, wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This guy comes in and he's like, okay, he's going to be a good guy, but he's not. And he's he not also a part human, but not. Yeah, <laughs> but not too human. You know what I mean? On the side of the angels, but also a monster. <laughs> it's like biblical right there. I know. And I was like, okay. This is God's freaking zones. <laughs> exactly. God. It's not that hard. Godzilla. Oh, there you go. <laughs> the duo chose to add small details to make Godzilla seem more realistic, such as the Nick take Tating eyelid. Weird. The duo took inspiration from Moby Dick for the story concept. So mm. they said they found the Ahab archetype could be more interesting if it were a woman who lost her husband to Godzilla. So I'm picturing a girl with an eye patch hunting Godzilla through New York City. Yeah. Played by Jamie Lee Curtis. Mm. Ew. Because I'm going <laughs> to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot described the story to be about obsession, redemption, inappropriate grief response. This actually doesn't sound terrible. Okay, Godzilla kills her husband, and she's on a revenge. As long as Godzilla's cool and he's stomping through the city like he does in Minus One, this could actually have the potential to have an interesting human element, too. But, like, what are you going to do? Well, like, I don't know, because the movie never got made. <laughs> Godzilla's a pretty big boy. The duo also wanted... You should have watched Minus One. <laughs> The duo also wanted to deliver a story that satisfied fans by adapting Godzilla's character from the first few Toho films. And one movie does what the first three Toho films did. Oh my gosh. They're trying to. F so they wanted to try and cram three film themes into one. It takes them from being a horrendous threat to being Defender of the Earth. So they're, they were going to do all of it. Wow. So they were going to do the he's evil, but then last second, New York says that their mom's named Martha as well. And Godzilla's <laughs> like, oh, oh, why no. did you say that name? I mean, eh. <laughs> All right, so they, they got a script they wanted. DeBont joined the project. Elliot had Rocio revise the script based on his notes, so DeBont's on. This is before DeBont left. Elliot and Rocio had the script they wanted. Um, They changed a weird... They made a weird pacing decision. There was going to be a 12-year time jump, but then they condensed it to one year. And then they had they still kept the eye patch lady in. Um, they Instead of what ended up happening, where they find his claws in the ice, they find his teeth. Um, let's see. Okay. Eventually, 95, two years later, Don McPherson comes in to rewrite the whole thing, and he's going to be the new director. He was a fan of Toho Godzilla films, LOL. Okay. The studio was concerned with the film's proposed $120 million budget, later revised to $200 million. How much money did this movie end up getting? So the budget was 150, 130 to 150. So they fired all these somewhat talented people who have experience launching a franchise right. over budget disputes. And then they ended up giving the person that was the least qualified, at least, to to have the budget he wanted. So Maybe it was cheapest. Perhaps, but... Like really cheap? I guess. So DeBont insisted all the film effects be entirely digital. So he's like, I'm all for green screen. I want CGI. I want all this garbage. Okay. He says the problem was that is that in this version of the movie, it was all effects. Godzilla was in virtually every scene. Right. That right there is a recipe for disaster because movies that are just straight up Godzilla the whole time are not that good. Yeah. <laughs> right. So McPherson was tasked with rewriting the script to match TriStar's ideal budget of 80 million dollars so they're like okay how about this oh, we like your idea so much back then <laughs> yeah he's like we like your idea except it sucks so we want you to chop down <laughs> we want you to dumb it down to where he's only in the movie half the time so that's what he starts doing he's requested to meet with production crew to pinpoint which scenes were deemed the most expensive the production crew reported that the three main problems were that considered difficult and costly were Godzilla's size his interaction with water and Godzilla's interaction with masonry buildings so they were like okay here's your problem everything yeah the whole movie <laughs> okay Can we have him fight just pull michael bay he'll be in the desert yeah <laughs> fighting the military for two hours 
Okay. While McPherson called Elliot and Rocio's original script terrific, he took issue with several of its ideas. So he's like, I love this, except the whole thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's see. I'm just going to scroll down here. They said they tried to make him similar to the Terminator, <laughs> where he has no humanity at all. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Again. Pick a freaking lane. <laughs> Well, that was the thing was like they couldn't. Everyone pick, has. It different. says it on here. They couldn't pick a lane. <laughs> so the script's depiction of Godzilla was relentless, noting very much a Godzilla POV. So you neither identified with Godzilla nor with the scientists trying to protect the world. He also took issue that the first half of the script was driven by destruction. By the script's midpoint, there would be monster fatigue and no encore. So they were concerned they blew their load too early and too much Godzilla, so it's like we get to the third act, and like, what else is there to do? <laughs> like, we've already destroyed the town. So, eventually, this is interesting. A graphic novel of this adaptation I'm trying to describe to you poorly came out in November 2018, so they made a graphic novel with this version entitled Godzilla 94. They had an interesting bit on his design. So, anyway, Roland Emmerich get on, Dean Devlin sign on. Uh, they said that uh, uh, they got on under the condition they would be able to handle the film their way. We discussed their way. It's like the same cliche characters. It's got the terrible stuff in it. Bad visuals. Dean Devlin and Roland, they wanted to focus on making Godzilla like an animal, like a, a, a something that's trying to run away from people and is trying to just protect its kids and go home. Uh -huh. They both turned down the... the Let's see. They both turned it down initially, like everyone else. They said it was dopey idea the first time we talked. When they came back to us, we still thought it was a dopey idea. So they were just like, this looks so dumb. I don't want to see it. Despite praising Elliot and Rocio's script, Emmerich discarded it, stating it had some really cool things in it, but it's something I would never would have done. I respect that. He's like, this is good, but this is not my style. I don't like that. Simply, I don't like that. Yeah. We started from the beginning. I didn't want to make the original Godzilla. I wanted nothing to do with it. I wanted to make my own. We took part of the original movie's basic storyline that the creature becomes created by radiation and it becomes a big challenge. But that's all we took. So then they tried to make it more modern. Here's where the design part came in. It was kind of interesting to me. He just decided to reinvent Godzilla's design because he thought the original Toho design didn't make sense. So he's looking at the original. He's like, that doesn't even look right. It's interesting... Jan DeBont, even though he's not directing anymore, he's still on it. So he's approving a lot of these decisions that are getting made. Uh, he said DeBont, so he started making the, the, the design, which is what we ended up getting in the movie. So he says uh, he created a Godzilla that was very close to the original, but it was not right because today we wouldn't do it like that. So they hired Patrick Totopoulos. Does that name ring a bell with you? That's from the story. Yeah. The That's main, the guy's name. Yeah. So the Matthew Broderick's the character, name, they that, named him Tatopolis. So the guy that created the design oh is the name. They, that, so apparently they thought the name was so funny that they were like, I got it. The main guy, he's going to be named after the guy that designed it. <laughs> wow. I'm glad you caught that. Godzilla originally conceived as a robust, erect, standing, plantigrade reptilian sea monster was reimagined by Tatopolis as a leaned digitigrade bipedal iguana-like creature that stood with its back and tail parallel to the ground. So that's what we got. We got a weird iguana creature that looked like that walked like a dinosaur. They also wanted to go with the chameleon thing, sort of, so they made it where he blended in with the buildings. It was at one point planned to use motion capture with humans, but it ended up looking like the original Godzilla. I think they kept that in the movie, but they didn't explain it because there are parts in the movie where he just disappears and no one can find him. Yeah. Because like he's like rampaging through the city. He turns one corner and they're like, where'd he go? And they'd make a big deal about it. Yeah. I feel like that's a lost element that they forgot to like implement. Mm. So you're saying the script was written. They cut out the part where he turns into Because legitimately it's not chameleon. like he go and it's not like he jumps in the water. Right. He's literally in the city. He's ginormous and they're they have helicopters following him. He turns a corner and he's gone. Yeah. So I'm like, there's literally no other <laughs> I remember Ray. watching Nostalgia Critics video on that. He's like, "What? How yeah, did you yeah, lose yeah. that?" <laughs> and that you might be right. They I, might they might have forgot to rewrite that part. Right, yeah. <laughs> and then they 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 cut out the important part that explained what happened, right. but they left the part that made it confusing. So they said no to human cap motion capture. So this is what's interesting. Tatopoulos thought the designs that Ricardo Delgado and Crash and Joey, all these other people from Debont 
took the design in the wrong approach, saying they did what they did, which was a mistake in my mind, was rather than going in a new direction, they tried to alter and make the old one better. When you do that, first of all, I think is very disrespectful. So they tried to change the original Godzilla design, and he said, I don't like that. We're going with the iguana. Totopolis took inspiration from the design of Shere Khan used in Disney's version of the Jungle Book in terms of Godzilla's chin. So he's, he's like, I'm going straight to Jungle Book to get the chin here. He had this great chin thing, and I always loved it. He looked scary, evil, but you respected him. I thought, let's try to give him a chin, and I felt it still looked realistic, but he had this different thing that he hadn't seen before. I'm already hating where this is going. He created four concept art pieces, a two-foot-tall man- maquette for a meeting with Toho. Okay. So Toho were like, why do you Americans? So, so everything you touch. Here's what's hilarious. Totopolis and Emmerich, they attended the meeting to pitch their Godzilla statue and their, their statue mm-hmm. and their artwork. They had four concept arts and they unveil it. And the Toho trio remained silent for a few minutes. <laughs> oh. Emmerich recalled they were speechless. They stared at it and there was silence for a couple minutes. And then they said, could you come back tomorrow? <laughs> I thought for sure we didn't have the movie then, is what he says. Tomiyama later recalled that it was so different we realized we couldn't make small adjustments. That left the major question of whether to approve it or not. Wow. So it looked nothing like the original Godzilla, which is what we were getting. And so they they were looking at it, and they were like, can you just like come back tomorrow, and we'll we'll, we'll tell you what we think? So it was so different. I, I guess they couldn't just tell him to go back and rework it. I wonder how close... Uh, that statue is to the one we got in 90. Right. So, even though Tomiyama was not allowed to remove the artwork and make it from the studio premise, Tomiyama visited Godzilla producer and creator Tomoyuki Tanaka, whose failing health prevented him from attending the meeting, to explain Totopolis' design. So, one of the guys took the thing and brought it to the original Godzilla creator. I told them it's similar to Carl Lewis with long legs and it runs fast. The following morning, Matsuoka approved the design, saying that the topless kept the spirit of Godzilla. So eventually they said they liked it. Hmm. Even though five seconds ago they were like, uh, we're going to need some time to process this. And they started counting their losses, looking at tax write-off purposes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do the lizard. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. I'm actually biased towards the lizard design. You like it? I mean, yeah, it was the first one I was introduced to. So. Oh, my gosh. It's kind of, yeah, I really like the lizard design. That's the end of this episode. Thank you for joining us. If you like <laughs> what you hear, then please consider subscribing. No, no. <laughs> we lost like 100 subscribers. We're back down to 50. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think that's all the interesting stuff I had. So they totally banded Atlantis is what I'm reading, even though it's very clear. Oh, here's what's interesting. They abandoned the atomic breath. Do you remember that scene? So he doesn't do the light up, shoot out his breath. So mm-hmm. what they what they wanted to do was the power breath. They wanted it where he breathes so fast and so hard that it just pushed everything away. Oh. So when they released that or it got leaked, everyone hated it. Right. Like they they despised it. So what they changed it to was mm-hmm. He breathed a very poisonous, toxic gas that if you were happen- happening to light a cigarette next to it, it would burst into flames. So there's a scene where he's yelling and he's breathing at a gas truck. The gas mm-hmm. truck explodes and it makes a green fire gas. That's supposed to be the atomic breath. So they're like, that's not realistic. People are going to think that's stupid. So they change it to power breath. Everyone says that's not realistic. That's really stupid. <laughs> so, so they they try. They said, "Well, we're still not doing atomic breath because it's unrealistic and stupid. We're going to find the middle ground." And so they did it where you potentially, if, if you were working with Godzilla, you could say, "All right, Godzilla, now!" And as he's breathing, you light it and it turns green. So I f- could have sworn there was atomic breath in that movie. That's what I was saying. Like, there's a scene where he's breathing, but it's next to a gas truck, and the gas truck explodes and it makes a green breath fire. Weird. That's I, I remember it being like a legitimate, like from his mouth, like. There's no scene where his back lights up and he uh, shoots out atomic breath. Okay. But there's a scene where he screams and then it it looks like green fires coming out of his mouth. Oh, okay. That's be, but what they did was they changed it where it was like a noxious gas. Well, thank God they kept the giant lizard realistic. Yeah. In my in my Godzilla fake film, so what was interesting to me was they were going to make this a trilogy. But, of course, it got canceled immediately because everyone hated it and it had nothing to do with Godzilla. Right. And it, I don't know if you knew this, but the movie did so bad that they that Japan disowned the film. And they were like, that's not Godzilla. So they took 
they took that version, they took the god out of Godzilla, and they just renamed it Zilla. Yeah, yeah. I bet I knew. Yeah. And doesn't, like, Zilla get... Didn't the Japanese make a movie where, like, Zilla gets freaking killed in, like, two that, seconds? That's the one we watched. So, yeah. yeah. In Godzilla Final Wars, <laughs> aliens abduct all the major movie monsters, and they abduct Zilla, <laughs> and they set Zilla loose on Godzilla, and then Godzilla kills him immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so much Japan hates it. But... <laughs> No, so it's so interesting to me that this movie got a real budget, even though that's why they turned down some pretty, I'd say pretty talented people yeah. who actually wanted to make, at least wanted to make a good movie. Mm-hmm. Whereas Roland Emmerich and D. Devlin kind of despise this franchise and they're like, we don't want to do it. And yeah. that's who they ended up giving the most money to. Yeah. And it flopped. And they ended up making a cartoon about this, which I'm told you, you've you seen. Yeah, I so, saw most, yeah. most of those episodes, actually. I liked it. Yeah. Uh, I thought they were good. I heard it wasn't that bad. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was better than the movie. <laughs> so yeah. Okay, so I have a question then. Yeah. What do you think makes a good Godzilla movie? Because it's obviously it's obvious that there's more to it than just a big CG monster wrecking havoc. There's something deeper there, right? So what do you think makes a Godzilla movie? And you've seen enough of them probably to tell the difference. Godzilla minus one really sh- reshaped everything. I might have to come back to that question. But wow. let's let's take... Minus one out of it. Mm -hmm. I think why the American ones are so bad, except for the first one, which Mm -hmm. ended up being the best one by default. Yeah. The original idea for Godzilla was he's a monster that is stomping around Tokyo, destroying buildings. He is a result of the atomic bomb. He is a statement against nuclear weapons. Right. That was good for one movie. After that, you can't just do the same thing over and over, right? So... After that, they just started creating some really cool villains, mm-hmm. and they started making these weird designs, and they just went crazy with it. And they had get they had different move sets, they had different weapons, yeah. they had goofy plots, and those movies just leaned into it. Mm-hmm. And Godzilla, he shows up. Now he's Earth's defender. Like no one's gonna stomp around Tokyo except him. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> they they come in on Godzilla's turf, and he's like doing all these weird moves, and you see how he overcomes these. But those were just fun. Uh-huh. What the? I just feel like the movies that just don't have any fun. So you think when they said that we're going to make it completely serious? Yes, serious, realistic. Let's ign- they despised the core idea of Godzilla. Mm-hmm. They didn't want the goofy monster fights. They didn't want the goofy origins. They didn't like his. They even said we don't like his goofy design. Yeah. We think it's dorky. We don't want it. There's a there was a lack of love for the source material. I see. Is what ended up happening. You get to Godzilla 2014, and that that it was the same thing. It was a statement on. You know, nuclear weapons and all sorts of stuff. Uh, nuclear reactors, yeah, EMPs. Okay, so that they kept that in there, and it ended up being pretty good. Godzilla's mm-hmm. barely in it, but in those scenes, he is in it. It's like his presence is there. The action's really good. Okay, but then you get to the very second one, and they just go straight for like, <laughs> what's the word? They tried to they tried to make it relevant, mm-hmm. and they tried to tie it into what modern audiences they thought would like. They tried to do terrible American tropes, stuff like that. Mm. Um, and then the third one, they're trying to copy the cinematic universe trend. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's just no love for just making a Godzilla movie. Mm. So you get to minus one, where we're back to, it's a statement on World War II. It's a statement on kamikaze pilots. It's a, sta- it's a, it's all, it's a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. But it's also got a Godzilla that is just super freaking dangerous. Yeah. When he shoots his atomic breath, it wipes out the whole city. Uh, Shin Godzilla. It's a statement on... Ch- uh, not ch- is it China or Japan? It's a statement on their, their government. Yeah. So in that movie, Godzilla, he's stomping around, and instead of launching attacks and launching weapons on it, the government's like, okay... Where's the Secretary of State? Where's he at? Okay, mm-hmm. he needs to approve this, and then we need to take it here, and they and then they they, they do all these weird approvals before they finally start attacking. Mm-hmm. And then whoa, Godzilla can shape shift. So there's a love for Godzilla. There's a new spin on him where he's shape shifting, mm-hmm. but also it's a statement on the government over in Japan and how dumb it is, how they mm-hmm. have to go through all these weird hearings and meetings while he's actively attacking. Yeah. So when they started when they finally get the ball rolling on attacking Godzilla, he just changes to a new form and now they gotta adapt. Wow. Well he adapted in ten seconds, the government's adapting through more meetings and hearings. And so there, there there's like a there's a statement that they're trying to make. There's a social commentary or political commentary. Yeah. And also just a love for a big giant lizard that goes stomping and destroying buildings. Right. 
That's what I think makes a good, a good Godzilla film. A love for the source material, a healthy respect for what Godzilla is and what he stands for and what he won't let stand for anything. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, something that the movie's trying to also tell, a story it's trying to tell or some kind of political or social undertones. Mm-hmm. You know? I think that's what makes a good movie. A love, I, I guess at the, <clears throat> at the heart of it, a love for the source material. Sure. So anyway, that's my thought. Hope that was coherent. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? What makes a good Godzilla film for you? Well, I haven't seen nearly enough to be like an expert on the subject, but I know that. Uh, honestly, I just love the. This is like probably a dumber version of what you just said, but I just kind of love seeing larger than life creatures that we have n- no control over. Humans mm-hmm. have no control over. Do not understand makes us feel, you know, like specs in the universe, you know, like completely waging war. It really is just like something that shakes, you know, the the world, you know, mm-hmm. like just because like, there again, the lack of control I think is what's really cool. Like there's nothing that can stop these two. They just have to duke it out. We just have to survive around it and watching just nature take its course in the most massive scale. Um, I think that's, you know, what is really cool to me just seeing all this happen. I don't like it when the humans are given things to do. It's like, what was it, Kong versus Godzilla? They have to go to the center of the earth and they have to get like the stupid MacGuffin <laughs> and that somehow, I, I completely forgot what they did. I'm, I'm starting to hate the word MacGuffin. I'm about to start calling calling it the McMuffin. <laughs> they have to go to the center of the earth and get the McMuffin and mm-hmm. fight, fight Godzilla. Yeah. So I'm with you. The one thing I do like about the American ones and... I like them less now as Japan makes better movies. Yeah. But I do like how big the monsters are. Yeah. Like like you said, like larger than life. Like they made Godzilla too big. And King Ghidorah has always been bigger than Godzilla. Right. So when Godzilla comes in and he's gigantic and now here comes King Ghidorah and he's three times bigger and then Mothra, like all sorts well, of it's, stuff. It's very like H.P. Lovecraft-like, you know, that yeah. there are these creatures that legitimately are so massive they can be seen from continent to continent, mm-hmm. um, and they're just like on Earth somewhere. Yeah, and that's kind of scary. Just like right. thinking about that because there's so much of the world we don't know, and what happens when they show up? Yeah, what happens when they disagree? You know, it's mm-hmm. just like and just to witness the conflict rather than be um, a contributor to the conflict. Yeah, I think that really just is powerful enough. Yeah, I, I'm with you. And the American ones, they won't lean into the goofiness. So they want to they they put the characters that would have been the fairies that summon mm-hmm. Mothra. They're in there, but they won't commit to them. So they just make them like twin sisters that are just there. And then they, King Ghidorah, King Ghidorah is an alien. They mm-hmm. reference it, but they don't fully commit to yeah. There's aliens. Like right. King Ghidorah came from another planet. Like there's, I don't know. There's there's a shame in there. And there's an underlying hint of the shame of what Godzilla is and just what the lore is, and they're just trying to avoid it. I, re- I rewatched the uh, Radon versus Mothra, the newer, the American movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a cool fight, but those are like two of my favorites, like yeah. fighting it out. I'm just like, gosh, just the colors they use, yeah. you know, and just like the sound of the design. There wasn't dialogue, but we could tell what was going on. We could tell what was going through their heads, you know, just yeah. like it's survival of the fist, you know, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. That was really cool. Yeah. I do like how King Ghidorah's each head is like independent mm-hmm. and they're like fighting each other. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was funny. So anyway, happy birthday, Godzilla. Thank you for 70 years. Way old, defending the earth. Yeah, way, way older than me. Thanks for saving the earth so many times. Thanks for destroying Japan and also protecting it <laughs> for 70 years. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. They need to go kick in the pants every once in a while. You know what? As bad as that new Godzilla and Kong movie is going to be, I'll probably see it just because I love you so much. I'm going to support it. Wow. Hope Godzilla minus one gets a sequel. Whether you are lizard or doofus looking, uh, or goofy or whatever they yeah. call them, like we love you, Godzilla. We do. I don't like Zilla, but I like Godzilla. Mm. Okay. Here's the Godzilla plus two, and many more. Guys, thanks for joining us this week on the Third Wheel Podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed your time here, and we definitely enjoyed having you stop by. We will see you next time. Have a great New Year. And hopefully, we'll be in a better sounding studio. Love you guys. See you next time.